Hi, Sue. Thanks for joining me, friend. Oh, I'm glad that I could be here. I'm, th I'm really looking, looking forward to this conversation. Me too. Uh, I read your books several years ago, uh, the two in the Semiosis series that are out currently, uh, when my friend River recommended them to me. And as you know, I wrote a blog post about them. And yeah, just it was really enjoyable to reflect on the different themes that I saw in the posts and in the blogs, uh, sorry, in the books. And um, yeah, since then, actually, I've written one and a half novels of my own. I started working on fiction and have become even more interested in fiction and writing novels and stuff like that. So that's something I'm really excited to talk to you about as well. So, um, but yeah, just to start off, I'd love to ask you about your life story. For me, where someone's coming from and what they've been through in their life really informs a lot of the topics that we have as shared interests that I want to ask them about. And I love seeing the connections between people's lives and what they've been through and what things they're interested in and how they see the world. And I think to me, like these conversations are a chance to get to know someone really well and everyone is totally different. And I'm always, when I listen to people answering the questions that ask them, I'm just like wondering what's it like to be them and how do they experience the world? And everyone's totally different. And the way that someone understands their life and what they've been through and their life story really helps me frame that and understand what it's like to be them. So I love to ask people that question. And I know it's kind of a huge question, but people can answer however they want and whatever like they want. I'm happy to hear whatever people feel like sharing. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you about your life and what's happened to you so far and how you understand your life. Well, uh, well, since you want to be a writer, um, how did I become a writer? And the answer is, I have always wanted to be a writer. Um, I remember when I was a little girl, I my mother would read me books because I, I couldn't read. And at some point, I learned that people wrote those books that she was reading for me. And I thought, well, I can do that too. Um, and I really, really wanted to I knew when I went to first grade, I was going to learn to write. And I really wanted to do that. So I, um, on the first day, she says, I came back and I had one of those pieces of papers. They have the big line pieces of papers for little kids learning to write. And I said, mommy, mommy, I can read. I can read. And I held it up and I said, see the apple, see the red apple. And she looked at it and there was a drawing of an apple. But I was sure I could read. Um, and eventually I did. Th those were, I remember learning to write those. I don't remember drawing the apple. Um, and apples are my favorite fruit to these days. I don't know if that's coincidence, but anyway, so I always wanted to be a writer. Um, and I got bad advice as a child and, and that, well, you can never earn a living as a writer. Um, in fact, you can. Uh, I became a journalist. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I one of the reasons is that you just get to meet so many people and do so many things. Um, and then all you have to do is tell people about it. And so I worked as a journalist for a long time um, on some newspapers and magazines. I was in Milwaukee when I, I grew up in Milwaukee um, and was working there. Um, then um, I lost my job. So I began to, to move into freelance, and that's when I started writing uh, fiction seriously. This was back in the mid-1990s, um, and just kept doing it from there. So here I am. Uh, I write science fiction novels. That's my job. I'm 68 degrees, and I finally got my, my dream job. Um, and... So I write that, I write short stories, essays, journalism, poetry. Now and then I teach, I really did like to, um, do like teaching, um, but it doesn't pay well. Not that writing pays that much better, but writing, teaching is really, really hard work. Um, so that's how I became a writer. Um, another way to look at it, um, is how I got to this physical place. Because I said, I grew up in Milwaukee and I, and I grew up in a, in a blue collar family in a blue collar neighborhood, um, which 
left me with, I think, a, a good practical attitude. I met my husband, also in Milwaukee, but he grew up in a professional neighborhood. So we have what we call our subcultural differences. We actually have very, very slight differences in our accents in English, but we grew up in the same city, just different parts of the city. Um, well, and then he got a job in Texas, so we moved to Texas, to Austin, um, and discovered that Texans are very Texan, y'all. Um, but I had a good time there. And then we always wanted to live overseas. So he got a job to move to Madrid, Spain. We s thought we spoke Spanish. And so we'd never been to Spain, but we went and discovered that we somewhat spoke Spanish. Um, and... It, I spent eight years in Spanish classes. Um, we were there 17 years overall, but it was a good chance we wanted to learn another culture and discovered um, just how different a place is because not, you go there for tourists and you spend a week there and you notice that there's differences. But after, you know, like many years, you realize how different it is or how even things that seem the same are the same, but for very different reasons. Um, so that it was just a whole nother tra trajectory. Um, and I think that that helped me a lot understand how different people can be, even when they seem the same. Um, there's just a lot going on. Um, Plus the whole language thing. I For a while, I taught teenagers English as a second language. And Spanish teenagers are not like American teenagers for a bunch of reasons. It was very educational. Um, and they taught me a lot. I learned a lot about English, teaching them about English that I never even knew about. I just did. Um, and I think that helped me also as a writer to realize consciously what I was unconsciously doing. So anyway, we were there and then the economy crashed. So my husband could not get a job. Um, after two years, it wasn't going to happen. And so we moved back here to, and now I live in Chicago. I'm in a high rise. I live in the sky. Um, most, most, most people in Chicago actually live in bungalows. They live in, in like private houses. But everyone thinks that if you live in Chicago, you live in a skyscraper, and I do. Hmm. And that's pretty much my life story. Uh, one thing. So I came back to America after living overseas for a long, long time. And you don't get all the day-to-day -day stuff. So I came back, and it was a very different country from when I left. But part of it was just as looking around going, oh, my God, this is so American. Um, all of the things that you see in movies are real. And that sounds, but my Spanish friends would say the same thing. I visited America and it was just like, and you could see, and they had the telephone poles like you see. And I was on a train and the conductor said, all aboard, just like, and it was um, a couple of months of, of, I knew what was going on, but it was very entertaining to, to, notice that America was really different and was really like what everyone says it is, but you don't realize it until you're there. And it's like, oh my God, this is just so American. They don't do this anywhere else. Hmm. So that was a fun thing. I don't know what else I can tell you about my life story. Hmm. Although I try, we might want to discuss this now or later. I try to be inter introspective and they say you should know yourself. I'm really much more interested in other people and other places and other things than, than myself. I mean, I have to pay attention to what I'm doing and know what I'm doing and why. But other people are just more, much more interesting. I will never write an autobiography because it would be more fun to write someone else's biography. Uh, well, I guess it'll be my job to be interested in you then. Uh, what uh, Can you say more about these cultural 
differences between yourself and your husband that you've noticed over the years or earlier in your relationship? Um, some of it's age. He's six months, six years younger than me. So, you know, I remember when Jimi Hendrix was alive. He just doesn't have that experience. Um, blue collar ideas about hospitality, for example, are much more casual. If I go to his family, there might be China. And in my family, there would be paper plates. Um and um, some of it's the level of formality, the expectations. Do you go to college? Don't you go to college? Um, my parents, for my younger sister, they had a deal. We will pay for college or we will buy you a car. Because if you want to go to work, you're going to need a car. And so she got a car because she really did not want to go to college. And she had a very successful life and a, a, a not working, not having a degree. There's lots she could do. Um, so some of the expectations are different. Um, some of the day-to-day -day things. Um, and the blue collar emphasis on, on really pragmatic, practical things. Um, his family was not terribly wealthy. Mine definitely was not, although there was, was enough for everything that we needed. But we were much more careful about money. Um, and, well, and also, if you had a factory job, that was a good thing. And his family would never think of a factory job is something that would be desirable. And I've worked in factories. It's okay. It's a job. I like my coworkers. I made stocking caps. I know all about how to make a stocking cap in a mechanical um, way. And which is an incidental thing, but you know, I can tell you a good stocking cap from a bad spot stocking cap. What was your personality like as a kid? It's it's hard to know because you know I'm trapped inside my own head. I have judging from the way other people reacted to me, I think I was pretty outgoing. Um if not um stubborn. Um I know I refused to do things sometimes that got me in trouble. Hmm. Um, not always obedient. Um, ambitious too. Um, we had. I remember we had a reading, independent reading thing we could do in my fourth grade class, and my whole goal was I was going to get to the top as fast as I could. Um, so I did. Um, That's really all I know. You would need to talk to people who I'm sorry are are dead now, but they had a better idea of what I was like then. What were some of the differences that you noticed between American teenagers and Spanish teenagers? Spain's whole family dynamic is different. And it starts the word individualism in in English, especially American English, talks about rugged individualism and independence and that sort of thing. In Spanish, the word individualismo means selfishness. Hmm. So it's a much more community-oriented organized culture. It's much more family-oriented culture. Um, people think we have strong families here, but not because everyone is in this sort of individualistic con conflict with each other um that they want to do what they want to do but in spain there's always a sort of negotiation so that children want to be independent they want to do things and in a spanish family the more you can show that you you're responsible the more freedom that you get 
So in Spain, a 10 year old on the subway was just normal because they wouldn't be there if they couldn't handle it. Um, and you could expect that from them. Um, some of my older teenagers had no curfew because their parents knew they would come in when they had to. They weren't stupid. Um, so they got a lot more independence, but not individualism. Um, in some of our classroom conversations, we would ask about family because that was something that everyone could do and they could practice their English. And my job was to make them speak English as much as they could. And they all loved their family. I remember this this girl, she was um, uh, goth and with the makeup and this and that and everything. And she looked super tough. And she was saying, oh, I love to spend time with my family. And all our classmates are going, yeah, isn't that a good thing to do? Um, so that, but there's that give and take. But also when you get older, um, once you started to become elderly, you would seed independence to your adult children so that if your parents moved in with you because people weren't rich but also people need care um yeah the the daughter is now you know the female head of the household um the son-in-law is the man of the house they're pretty have role models there but anyway so and so they would make decisions and and older people would just go along with that. If there was a family business, it would be taken over and they would step to the back um, so that there's a lot more negotiating of roles. Whereas in this culture, I think we only have one. And part of it, I don't think is wrong because we don't have a supportive culture. Um, I noticed when I moved here, Americans are much, much more anxious. And I think one of the reasons is that there is no safety net. There is no guaranteed health care. If I get just a simple case of breast cancer, my entire savings, my entire retirement could be wiped out. Um, it could throw us into poverty. I'd have all sorts of trouble getting the, the care that I need or anyone else in my family that I need and that they might need if they got sick and it could still fail. Um, I had a cousin who was a very good woman, but not the smartest person in the world. And she got sick and two of her cousins, or her sister and her cousin, who were very smart women, had to battle for her care that she could not have done on her own just because, well, she was sick and she didn't have the wherewithal. And it was hard for these two to get her the care that she needed on the end of her life. Um, so we just have no fallback. Um, of course, people are fighting for everything that they can get at the expense of other people because it's the only way you can get anything. Um, it's, it's a cultural thing and we have problems here. And you can see that if you compare it to the way that other people live otherwhere. Can you say more about how the teenagers in Spain sort of surprised you or like a specific story that where that uh, cultural difference was really stark or what that was like for you? Well, another way is, is their schools are not as good as American schools or different in some ways. Um, and that's one of the reasons I, I was working as, a, as an after school tutor because they needed to learn English. And what they learned in their classroom was just grammar. And that's all they got. And my job was to teach them. Because when you speak, there's four parts. There's reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And if all you do is learn one, which is grammar, and that's writing, and they could pretty much do that. But all the other ones, that was my job to teach. Um, so I knew how to, to focus myself that way. Um, there's a lot of rote memory in, in their schools um, so that we might have an exercise where we split into two teams because if they could play a game, they didn't care how dumb the game was, they would play the game enthusiastically. So if, if there was a game, I did that. So they would each look at a picture. I remember one picture was of sort of an office um, 
and there was things in the pictures and stuff on the shelves and desks and, and they're taught rote memorization so that they can memorize anything. Um, so that, and then they would ask each other questions. We'd put away the, the, the pictures and um, they would ask each other the questions. And my job was to see if they did it right. And one was how many black squares in the tile were there on the floor? And the other team knew. They had they knew that that was the sort of thing that they could be asked, they would be asked. And I'm sitting there going, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, yeah, you're right. Because um, that would never occur to me as a significant detail to ask them. So that they were very, very good at any sort of rote memory, any sort of, of exam I could give them or test or game or fooling around, they could do that perfectly. If it was creative, they could not. One of the things I had to teach them was creativity because one of the things that they would have to do in the English test, because they were teaching to a test, which is not a bad thing if it's a good test. And this was a good test, but they were going to have to have a writing project um, and it would be one of a number of things and they would get a choice um, when they went to, to write a, you know, you can write a letter to um, a movie star saying you like their movie, you could do a review of a book that you've read, or you could write a story about a girl named Alice who has a turtle. Um, and I'm my job was to teach them that, but how do you teach them to write a story? They had no clue. Now I can go to my nephew who was the same age them. Can you tell, tell me a story about Alice with a turtle? And he was on it like that. And it was a pretty good story. They could not. So part of my job was to teach them how to write stories, how to be creative. Um, also I had a student who was older, but he was taught in the French system and he could not write an essay in anything other than the French system, which I knew would not get him a passing grade. So I had to teach him how to write an essay in a different way. Um, and somewhat also to be a little bit more creative because that is would be rewarded on the test. Because, I mean, the people who are doing the test, um, this was the Cambridge in, um, English uh, test, they would have workshops for teachers and tell you, we're going to ask them this, we're going to ask them about this, we need them to know this. Um, when they go to the, the um, oral part of the test, they have to talk to uh, someone. We expect them to do these sorts of skills to, to manifest this ability. Um, so I could prepare them very well. And since this was a good test, they were learning good things. Um, but this, I discovered that there were things they just were not prepared to do. Um, that they were going to have to do to pass this test and probably to get through life. Um, because as I say, Spanish schools objectively have some si significant failings. And part of my job was to deal with that within the confines of teaching English. How did you teach them of, to be more creative? One of the things I loved about teaching was that I had all these things that I needed to do. And it was as fun as writing a novel because I had to work out little pop. A, a, a goal. Sorry, I, 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 I dropped for a second there. You said one of the things you loved about teaching was that you had to work out different I, I would always have a plan, and then I would have a plan B, sometimes plan C. Um, I had little B games if we had just 10 more minutes to fill. Um, so it was fun. I really loved teaching. Well, I loved my students. Bosses, eh. But the students were great. How did you teach them to be more creative and to write like a creative essay? What did you do specifically? Um, there are exercises that you can do. Um, one of them that was always fun was I would have a sheet with spaces to write and it would start with a sentence for a story. Um, and then every student had to write the next sentence. Then they would pass it to the next person who would read how the story was going on that far. 
And then they would write the next sentence and pass it on to the next person. And, you know, we would go all the way around like six kids and then they would finish up their story. And so that they would each have multiple chances to work through what other people did and add to that. It's a fun thing to do with writers, grown-up writers too, people mm -hmm. who are professional writers, because mm -hmm. they can have a lot of fun with that kind of exercise. Can you tell me what it was like to become a journalist and what that involved for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I started doing that actually in junior high and basically it's, it's you get an assignment or you can find it an assignment and, and suggest it to your editor and they'll say yes or no. Um, and prepare questions, talk to people, get information and then write it up in a more or less logical way. Um, and those are pretty easy skills. The hard part, I think, is find what is a story? Um, what would be interesting? Either interesting, something that people need to know, want to know, or would enjoy knowing. Um, and spotting that, I think, is probably the trick. And the rest is is more or less mechanical. There's there's a lot of creativity to that too, but you just walking around and you know why is that that way and not another way? Or I've been going by this building and it's been empty for three years. What's going on with that building when everything else around it is doing well? Um, huh. Trying to think of stories that I wrote that um, that I assign myself. Well, and sometimes other people will suggest that, or they'll say, "Hey, I have a llama farm. Well, what's a llama farm like? Um, can I get someone to pay me to go find out what a llama farm is like?" Um, I got kissed by a llama in that story. Um, they, well, actually they're trying to smell your breath, but they just put their, their lips on your cheek so that they can get close. Hmm. Um, and, um, just looking, you know, what is the story? I know there's a bar a few blocks down, um, that has been a gay bar forever, but it started out when this was, was not a terribly gay friendly neighborhood or not gay unfriendly, but just not. But now it's it's really a pretty gay neighborhood. So how has that bar changed? That could be a story. Um, so looking for things that other people would find interesting, hopefully, and then being able to tell them that. Were there any specific themes or like beats that you covered as a journalist? Well, I was signed City Hall for a long time. Um, so you got to see how governments worked or didn't work. Hmm. Um, uh, a lot of times it's really pretty cooperative. Um, then there was one, there was a school board and you got some people on it who were very concerned about the curriculum of the school board and were they teaching the right things. And... Among the other problems is that took their eye off the real job of the school board, which is making sure that it, it's financially operating. Um, and they gummed up the process so long with their ideology that schools literally started falling apart. I mean, the roofs were falling in because no one was handling the actual maintenance of the delivery of education and worrying way, way too much about why exactly this book is in the library. Did you learn anything Which, about ethics during that time as a journalist? Well, I mean, you could see it all the time and you do now. Um, my job was to write truthfully about things. There's a whole ethic about that. Um, 
which today you can see is and isn't practiced all the time, telling the truth um, as, as a profession isn't something, well, it's just a problem and it's an ongoing thing. Um, also being fair to people um, because you would meet people who were caught in one situation or others, it's not their fault. They're in this trouble. Um, and you could do a lot of harm to them. And I tried to be aware that that was just not fair and not, not right. I remember um, there was a, a a guy who protested basically everything. And he was doing this big anti-abortion protest. Well, it was not a big anti-abortion protest. It was like humans three other people. But he made a lot of noise. And we were also writing uh, an article about, a series of articles in the newspaper about abortion. And I pretty much ignored him. And one of my reporters who was very anti-abortion said, thank you for doing that because he's just not, representative of what we're doing he's um he's just in this for ourselves himself and the rest of us have real reasons that that we're doing what we're doing and so some of that was also picking who you're going to spotlight um this was also before the internet i have to point out because the internet has changed everything um and anyone can wind up in the spotlight for doing one tiny stupid thing and then there's a big problem. And back in my day, um, I ignored a lot of things that would do no one any good. Um, so there was always a constant ethic as a journalism is, are we reporting what is it truthful? Is it fair? Um, is it factual? Is it something that people really need to know to as, as citizens to handle their lives um, in a way that, that makes their lives better. Um, so there was an ethic, but that this was back then and now there are people who do that. And then there's the internet where it's just um, savage sometimes. I'm reminded that I really like movies or novels where it's sort of, I guess it's sometimes in like the mystery genre where the, the journalist is a journalist is a character. And often I think the thing that I really like about those stories, like you know, all the president's men or Zodiac or something like that is that the um, there's kind of a virtue of like resourcefulness in those stories where the journalist has to be creative about how to get to the bottom of the story and find out what's mm -hmm. really happening. And I'm curious how much that kind of story tracks to your own experience as a journalist and how much resourcefulness is a part of it, or if it's just like, oh, those are just stories or, yeah. Oh, no, people do that. I never had to do some of the harder things that I, that I know other people have done, um, like going undercover, although one of my reporters did that sort of on her own, but she would put on this dumb housewife act hmm. and ask all sorts of questions and people would tell her. Um, or sometimes if you just go to the janitor, they know things and they, and if you are just asking them, so where did everyone go? Oh, they're over there. And they're trying to hide from you. Um, so those are some of the little tricks um, is and there's questions, is that totally ethical? Um, and sometimes you have to weigh that on how important it is. I didn't have to do that in any of my assignments, particularly. I could be very straightforward, but other people did um, if I ever had to. I mean, you go to training, you learn this stuff, you talk to other people, um, they explain things and... and techniques for doing that um so yeah i mean i know i don't have any really good stories i'm afraid mm -hmm. about what i did 
yeah, I was just curious how much that tracked to uh, the experience of a real journalist versus uh, stories. That gives me a sense of it, that sometimes it would be a part of the job and sometimes not. And it kind of depends. I like the, I like the bit about the janitor. That's interesting. So. Um, yeah, there was a, she was looking for the school board and the school board didn't want to have a public meeting, although they were required to have a public meeting hmm. and they weren't in their usual place. And so she asked the janitor and he said over there. Mm. Clever, clever. Huh. Am I remembering, I think I remember reading in something on your website that you did some reporting about a serial killer or something like that. Is that right? Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, oh, okay. I covered the he, both as an editor and as a reporter, um, there was a lot going on. Um, and I did some coverage for the gay newspaper, too, and, and talked to you know, people who knew some of the victims. Um, so, the, well, it was big and it was highly unpleasant. Um, one interesting thing is that there are things that, because this was before the Internet, um, and without speaking to each other, all of the media covering it, there are details that we did not report because they were simply inappropriate. Mm. Um, and you can find them. I mean, we didn't hide them. They're in the public record. You can look them up. Um, if you ask me privately, I will tell you, but not in public. And you couldn't do that now. But I think we knew that we had to shield people from some of the really gruesome stuff. And also, I mean, we build my newspaper, the one I was working at, at the time, as a family newspaper. So you could put this on the, your your coffee table and your kid could pick it up and they might be bored, but they wouldn't come upon something inappropriate. And they were inappropriate things. What's the value that is behind that kind of discernment or decision? It was just too awful. I didn't want to type those words. Hmm. I didn't want people to read me having written those words. I remember one of my reporters when and at one stage, she came up to me and said, you know, I need to report and, you know, I've learned these things. And I said, well, you can report about this and this. You can hint at that, but don't mention that. And hmm. she said, thank you. Hmm. What was that like for you personally to do reporting on that kind of thing? It was painful because I saw a lot that was going on that was very troubling. Um, but also I could, for example, um, Dahmer's victims, quite a few of them were people who were thrown out of their family for being gay and talked to other people. There was a guy, um, he ran a, a, a chapel and a meal service for kids. He was a Christian man, uh, for kids who, or anyone who was on the street and needed a meal and he would give them for them. Cause if you're 16 and on the street, you are really, there's all sorts of problems that you have in addition to just being homeless, but being 16 just makes it a crime to be on the street. And so there's problems. So he would just feed these, ki these kids and he knew them. And so I could tell some of their stories, how they got there. But one of the things he said that always struck with me was his family threw these kids to the wolves and the wolves got them. Mm. And just how hard that was for everyone to know that 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 was the fate of those children and it goes on today things have not gotten better mm -hmm. one of the things i learned as a journalist is you can i i still believe this you can pick any person at random and they have a fascinating story to tell but some people's stories really really need to be be told um and that's one of the jobs of a journalist is to make sure that the people who aren't being served, but who could be served by the place where they live, 
get to have their stories told and understood that they have a problem that could be solved and no one's solving it mm -hmm. or no one's trying hard enough or they could with just sometimes some simple little things. Sometimes that happens too. There's, there's success stories. The way you're talking about this and also the discernment about what to publish or not seems like there, at least for you, there is a lot of compassion in deciding what stories to focus on or knowing how your words would impact people and whether it was useful for them to hear it or not, or would be helpful or beneficial or just like distracting or painful or, you know, hurtful to read. Does that uh, match your experience? Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be part of the ethic mm -hmm. of understand that you're dealing with human beings here and that you owe them a duty in all sorts of different ways. Can you say more about the duty that you owe people that you're reporting on? Uh, well, again, what do they, what do the people you're reporting on? If you say something about them, is that going to hurt them? Um, even in small little ways, there was uh, uh, some old ladies got a, a, a city award for the best garden. Um, but they didn't want it reported because they were afraid that their garden people would come and steal things. So we didn't report it mm. because maybe they were right. And they were just two little old ladies and defensive and kind of scared. Mm. So we just, you know, okay, that didn't happen. Mm. Or at least we didn't report on it. Um, when I was covering a police beat, there was this woman who kept trying to commit suicide Um I never mentioned that because that was her problem. Mm. Um, and that was not something that needed to be reported on. Um, but to go back to Dahmer, where the police gave victims back to Dahmer, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Can that, will that necessarily happen again? Um, and can, what can we do to avoid that? Um, so that kind of reporting, too, is that if the police are failing their citizens, what, how, why, and what can be done? Hmm. Um, it sometimes criticizes advocacy journalism, but it isn't. It's only advocacy journalism to people who don't want to see it in print. How did reporting on the Dahmer cases, uh, how did you come to understand who he was or another person like him? How do you understand someone like that? He was, and, and this is not a secret. He was seriously mentally ill. Mm -hmm. um, he had two distinct problems that were incompatible. Um, and he just, it, uh, his behavior was to try to, to, to make those work together. And of course they couldn't in just horrible and gruesome ways. Um, but, um, if he had been just one or the other, he might've been okay, but both at the same time just drove him to something very exceptional behavior. Um, but under Wisconsin law, he knew what he was doing was wrong. And we can tell because he tried to hide what he was doing. And so that's why he was not, although he was mentally ill, he was not criminally insane. And that was a difference. Um, and he should have been able to get help for this, and he could not. I mean, there's, there's, um, I knew what the mental health services were available in Milwaukee at that time. If, if you had a problem, could you get free help? You could get a maximum of three counseling sessions um, from a volunteer, um, and it was not necessarily unhelpful. I mean, I knew the people doing that; they were doing their best. But that was all you could get. Um, so that even if he had sought help, it wasn't going to happen. So 
there was nothing, there was no safety net for him either. Um, there were just multiple failures all the way along this. And, and he had had problems even as a child. And even then, I mean, he couldn't have, he couldn't get help. Um, what he tried to do, um, also, he was just a raging alcoholic. And you could tell when you read all the details that, that he was trying to control himself, but alcohol doesn't work either. Um, so I don't want to say I feel sorry for him, but I understand the situation that he was in. And there was just no good answer for him. Yeah, I could imagine someone saying, oh, you know, someone like that is possessed by demons or they're intrinsically evil or, you know, they're a sociopath or something like that. And it sounds like the way you understand him is someone who had like very severe problems and they were sort of compounding on each other and he couldn't get help. And that led to really terrible behavior that really hurt people. Is that, is that kind of how you understand him? Yeah, that that's how I would describe him. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't, I kind of feel sorry for him because the system failed him too. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? And it fails all sorts of people. Um, there doesn't have to, I mean, there are people I can see, I, there's a park outside my window and they're living in tents in the park. That shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. But the system has failed them too. Do you have a sense or opinions of what kind of help someone might, like that might need? Oh, man. Uh, Dahmer, he needed long psychological help. Um, hospitalization would have been a good thing. Should have started when he was much younger. Um, but you can't get that here. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm really curious about how you view ethical issues and psychology of different people. And I think uh, how that shows up in your fiction and how you make sense of other people. I think that was, I was rereading the post I wrote about um, semiosis and that series. And, um, you know, I was sort of speculating about how I interpreted the character of Steve Lind and stuff like that. And um, yeah, maybe that's as good a point as any to start talking about fiction and writing is... Uh, because I'm, I'm interested in fiction in general. And then also, yeah, your sense of ethics and things like that. Ethics was seemed like a really huge theme in, in those two books. And um, I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to say about Steve Lund as a character. And um, yeah, I'd be very mm -hmm. curious to hear about that. Well, when, when I, I decided or began exploring the idea of whether I wanted to write this book, I began to learn about plants because my thought was, well, it started, one of my house plants attacked another house plant. Um, and then I began to find out more about how plants relate to each other, what plants can do. Um, and there was just a lot. Plants are very aware of what's going on. Um, these guys back here know exactly what time of day it is. Um, they know where they are and they know what's around the roots. They make decisions. Um, about how to grow and what to do. So what if they could think? And that was the basis. So what if I had a plant that could think? What would that plant be like? The way I, I came up with Stephen's personality is that what we know about plants is that they're always in a case of existential angst. It's, it's a tough life to survive in. Um, they have to do a lot of things. Um, they never get in, you know, quite enough of everything. They're in competition. Um, they're very, very aware of what's going on around them um, in all sorts of, of different ways. They have lots of, of skills and abilities, and they have lots of coping mechanisms, too. Um, so you have a creature who is very aware um, always kind of act, active, actually aggressive. Some plants are very aggressive. Um, uh, but the one thing we know particularly about um, trees and larger plants is that these are 
often social creatures. Um, they live best together when they're in a group, they communicate, they try to help each other. Um, so if you tack on the social element of that, if I had a plant and Steveland is the only kind species of his species that he knows about, he chose a, a male pronoun, but he's actually got three sexes and it's complicated. Um, so he's the only one of his kind that he knows about. And he can talk to other plants, but they're not quite right. They're not, and, and he's just so lonely. One thing we know ourselves as a social species is that um, solitary confinement is torture. We need to have other people around us. So he's got, all sorts of anxiety issues and abandonment issues. And so then when he gets, discovers humans and he has someone he can talk to and be part of their society, he reacts well, but when they are threatened, he will do absolutely anything to protect them. Um, all his ethics go out the, the window because he's going to protect them because he has to, because for his survival. And that's pretty much the whole plot of the story. Hmm. But he's also aware that of what he's doing. Hmm. And I, this is pretty in the weeds and, you know, it's for what well, would just be interesting to folks who've read the stories, which I actually really recommend. I, I love them so much. And that's part of why I wrote a post is just to, uh, talk up the books. I thought I thought they were so good. And um, but um, I was sort of wrestling in that post with whether he was a reliable narrator and whether he. I mean, I, I think someone could argue, and some of the characters in the book do argue that he's sort of a sociopath and not, uh, you know, actually considering other people's welfare and is only considering his own welfare and. I didn't find myself persuaded by that personally, um, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. No, he's he's not a sociopath. Mm -hmm. um, there's specific things and he just does not feel that. He is, however, extremely anxious mm -hmm. um, and, and has, you know, all these abandonment issues. And, and so he behaves actually like a human in that situation. Mm -hmm. They're not sociopaths. They just have to, to, protect themselves by protecting other people um they will do anything to maintain the the society that they need to live in um so it's a, it's a very different thing mm. but he would he gets scary at sometimes and i can see why someone would think he's a sociopath but he never quite cross, crosses that line mm -hmm. other things and he knows that you know that you know he, he does bad things um, and maybe he shouldn't, but he really feels compelled to, to protect his humans. I really loved him as a character. And I also was so tickled that at the end of the second book, there's other individuals of the species and how those characters were different. And I know that, uh, I don't know, I'm excited to see what happens in the third book about, about those characters. So. Um, well, the third book takes place on earth so that, there's whole different characters. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Um. But what a friend pointed out, she read um, semiosis and what she said she liked was that all of the humans were really trying to work together and, and trying to help each other um, for the most part um, and, and trying to make sure that, that their society functioned and everything that was being done needed needed to be done got done so that um it's 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 not a dystopia it's a in some ways the the colonists came to this planet and they wanted to set up uh an a society with some ideals and they succeed um they face a great many problems but in the end they have a, a, a functioning society that takes care of its members that helps each other that sees to its future. Um, and and so they they had a goal and they succeeded. And it was a good goal. Mm. 
and I should say, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. And um, when I wrote their whole constitution, there's parts of it that's included in the book, but I wrote the whole thing. And parts of it, of, of what I wrote, I really stole from our constitution. Um, you know, what some of our ideals are. And mm -hmm. then the book was, could I actually make a society that does those things? Mm -hmm. That knows that there's going to be hardship and willingly works for hardship, but that there can also be support and there can be joy and there can, can be community. I'm amused because I, I was raised Unitarian Universalist. And so I'm like, oh, this that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I was also thinking earlier when you were talking about uh, reporting about the, the city hall and the different politics as a journalist, I was like, oh, I think that sort of informs some of the scenes where there's yeah pretty intricate like politics of the of the other world and different people having different views and trade-offs between them that was really well done and I'm like oh makes sense that you would be able to write that so well given your past experience yeah that was not the Cudahy City Council but it was <laughs> that's so funny uh, um it's like I've been there now I haven't been to that city council but I I know what that's like now so um yeah, I'm curious. I don't know how to ask this question, but like, you know, I was asking about Steveland in particular earlier and we were saying, oh, there's different individuals and you're talking about how the, the books were inspired by learning about your house plants. And uh, I'm just curious how you view plants and animals and humans now. Huh. Um, well, again, some of it's from you use them and some of this is actually from studying science. We are all one with the universe. People mm -hmm. say, you know, I want to become one. No, the universe is already one with you. All you have to do is is understand that that it's you're there. There's no barrier between you and it. Um, but if I'm one with the universe, I'm I'm one with my my little pet right here too, um, and I consider them pets. Um, they're entities of their own, and and they have their own personalities and things that they want. Um, so. Um, I, the difference between me and them is basically that I walk around and they don't, um, I mean, there's physical differences, but in terms otherwise, um, to me, they're just more living beings, um, that are in my life. Um, and when I walk down the street, I notice the trees, see how they're doing. Um, because they're too, um, to some extent, have their own personality. They are very, very aware of what goes on with them. I remember a tree I pass, and one year during a polar vortex, it split, as trees will do when it gets super cold, and then it healed. So I can you know, walk by, and it's good to see that you're doing well. Mm. Um, but if I'm one with the universe, how different can these things be from me? Unfortunately, I have to eat them, but that's my role in the universe too. I joked when I wrote um, Semiosis in, in the following books that my goal was to make you afraid of your garden. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way that's true, but also to love your garden more, to understand th that these plants, if they could talk to us, they'd have a lot to say. And they do communicate with us, plants do. We forget that. But if you have a tomato bush, now understand the tomato plant wants you to eat the tomatoes because that's how they spread their seeds. In fact, you can eat a tomato and if it's fresh, it will go straight through you and the seeds are still good. Um, so they want you to eat that. So what do they do? They tell you when you should eat the tomato. The tomato turns a color and that's the, the plant communicating with you that you should eat the fruit. So they, they don't talk to us often, but when they do, they're really good at it. Hmm. You see humans as superior to plants or animals? Nah, mm -hmm. no. Um, we're more active. We have our role, but 
no, the universe is created full of equals. Hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Hmm. Would you describe your novels as moralistic? I test moral ideas. Um, I They're not in the sense that they want to teach you a lesson, but what if people really tried to do the right thing? Um, what if someone knowingly does a wrong thing? In the third book, there's a character who deliberately inflicts harm on someone else because of reasons. And then what? In the next like two chapters, knowing that she did that, what are the consequences? Hmm. What what holds your interest about ethics and makes you want to test moral ideas with your fiction? The simple answer is that they make good stories. Mm -hmm. um, and people really do like to read them. If you're reading like a murder mystery, the, the moral of a murder mystery, the whole plot is that um, good, good overcomes evil. Um, and, and it's a very simple story in that way, but there's all sorts of complications and a good mystery story will wrap you around a whole lot of questions. And, you know, if someone did get murdered, maybe they kind of had it coming, but maybe not. And if it's the person who did this really guilty and, and a good mystery can wrap you around those sorts of questions. Um, so those are the stories we want to tell people in general want a story to manipulate them emotionally. They read this to test out, to enjoy emotions. Um, and that can be very simple emotions. Horror stories is, is experimenting with fear in some way. And that's one of the reasons why younger people like them a lot is it gives them a way to go through fear and understand fear because as an adult that's you're going to spend a whole lot of time in some highly uncomfortable situations so they do that as a, a way to experiment with growing up a young a lot of young adult um, does that um uh older adults what is fair um if you uh, i remember a book uh, it's called swift water and it was a big award winner when i was in fifth grade and our teacher read us that during our snack time. Um, but so a young man gets thrust into an adult role. Well, what are the ethics of that? How does that work? What does that mean for his personal development? Um, so there's the ethical story behind that too. So those are the stories people want to learn is, is that, and there's exceptions and those are fine too. But, um, to get an understanding of other people um, and in a way to test out empathy too uh, and to understand how other people go about what's in their lives. When you think back on stories that you've loved as a reader, what is your experience of fiction and like, why do you read stories? I mean, you're, you're talking about people want to be emotionally manipulated and um, test things and test empathy and learn more about other people. Is that what your experience is or what's it like for you? Um, those are probably the stories I love best. I just read the latest Murderbot novel. Hmm. Um, anyone who doesn't know about that, Murderbot is a sort of a, a um, android-like creature, part machine, part human. Um, and was being held as basically a slave, um, managed to break free with that. But he's got all sorts of, or it, um, what about is an it? He's a, it's got all sorts of emotional problems in part because it knows some of the bad things it's done in its past. Some is just the way that it is. Um, and so in this part of the novel, it's dealing with some horrible things that happened in its past, but it's, then it's got to do some other things. Um, 
it's got an attitude of humans are stupid and I will kill myself to save them. Um, so there's a conflict right there. Um, and so it's Murderbot in this particular novel having to um, deal with the situation that it is in and, and the problems that it has and flashbacks that it's have, having with the what happened previously. Um, and then um, just dealing with other things. I, mean, I don't want to do a spoiler, but it, it's been dealing with the machine intelligence at one point. And it's starting to have some real doubts about the machine intelligence and, and what its um, motivations are. And then in two words, you know everything. And Murderbot is just saying, oh my God, I can't even think about this right now. Mm-hmm. So it, it's Murderbot is a deeply conflicted character in, for me, the fun, but also the, 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 the emotional pleasure for me was watching Murderbot deal, go through a difficult situation and having to cope without all of the coping skills that it needs. So again, it was, you know, I read that to have my heart um, at one point torn out because, oh my God. Um, And I could think of other books, but that's just the one I most recently read. Hmm. What are some of the authors or stories that have influenced you the most? Hmm. You, know, you you said you were going to ask that, and I thought about that, and the easy answer is everything I've ever read. Mm-hmm. Um, but a more serious answer is sometimes I read things for different reasons. Um, the storytelling. Uh, I remember when I was in high school and I wanted to be a writer, I read Back to Back, um, Hemingway, and um oh, sure william william faulkner hemingway and faulkner who are really very different kinds of writers and to give myself an idea of what the um the range was of the kinds of ways that you could tell a story um but why else? I like to read China Mieville just because he takes an idea so seriously and does amazing things with it. Um, his his novel Embassy Town takes some ideas of language and brings them to their extreme. And as someone who deals with language, um, it was you know, the characters, and I wanted them to survive in in tough places and saw them make their choices, but also like, okay, so what are we actually doing with language? Um, So he left me with just not only an emotional story, but an an intellectual one. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to, no, I'm not. Chuck Tingle. I read a Chuck Tingle story. Um, And he writes all sorts of things. A lot of it is, is, really sweet pornography um but i did it because they're just such sweet stories um and i wanted to read something about some people who did things and it was nice and it worked out Hmm. Hmm. what has captivated you about science fiction and writing science fiction? Why, why have you gravitated towards writing that in that genre? Um, well, because I've liked it since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I like about it is that I can basically do anything. I mean, I know people who, for example, wrote romance, and you pretty much know at the end they're going to be happily ever after or happily for now at least, and that's fine. Um, and I write, read romances too, sometime. Um, but in a science fiction novel, I can destroy the earth. I can save the earth. Um, I can just get someone out of trouble. 
Um, I can um, like China Miedo. What happens if human language runs into these aliens who are going to deal with very, very differently? So I can just basically do anything. And with steampunk, I can go into the past and mess with technology. And how does that affect people? Um, so I guess it, it's just the, the absolute freedom to do anything. That's one of the problems, though, is when you go to, go to start to write a story, if you can do anything, um, there's just choice overload. Hmm. So part of, for me, in some ways, the stories is just starting to work down all of the things I can do into something that's more or less manageable. What do you think makes for a really good science fiction novel, either one that you enjoy reading as a writer, as a reader, or one that you've written that you're proud of? Ones that I enjoy reading. Um, well, one I particularly enjoyed, um, So Like the Lightning by Ada Palmer, in which there is a very unreliable narrator, and not to give anything away, but just halfway through, it's like, oh my God, this was not the story I thought I was reading. Um, but what she, she did with characters there, um, and the person I thought I was rooting for is suddenly very different, and can I still root for him? Can I still want him to succeed, and why? Um, so, um, again, it's an emotional story. People, people like that, and I like that, and... So, I mean, I know Ada, and I was very proud of her for having written that and really enjoyed that um, and got to tell her that I got to got to be total fangirl. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't know. That's that's there's just so much. Um, Again, um, uh, if people like my books, there's children of time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. And I got to be total fanboy with girl with him too. But again, he has some people in a dire situation. And what I think makes the novel, and I was reading it in, in a Kindle and I had it turned on and like everyone highlighted these this like one sentence toward the end that makes the whole book and turns everything into an um the ethics of this book into just such a luminous place um but he also has like intelligent spiders um and and so what would an intelligent spider be like and how would they make their um lives and what would it mean to them to finally encounter humans no spoilers but there was just such a beautiful ending to that book. Hmm. How about for yourself as a writer, when you've finished your novels, what makes you feel proud of them? Where you're like, yeah, I really like how I did that. Or uh, I'm, I'm assuming you feel proud of your novels because I think they're great. But uh, yeah, what, what makes you feel proud of them? Or like, oh, that was really good. I like that. Okay, it's, it's the luminous thing that... Um that Tchaikovsky did. Um, I t went to a talk, Guy Cosleo Magno, and he's the he's a big science fiction fan, but he is also the um, Vatican astronomer, um, but he's a big science fiction fan. And talking about from his point of view, because he's a Christian brother, of how God can fit into a story. And um, again, it's at the end, is there something that adds for him the light of God, but the light of humanity, the light of something bigger at the end of a story. Um, some people write things that, you know, everything's bad and then it gets worse and everyone's horrible. And there's a place for those sorts of stories, but I'm not so fond of writing them anymore. Um, I should know his name, Corey Doctorow who is also a science fiction writer, um, says there's a certain kind of story he's not going to write anymore. Um, and that was a result of um, 
when in 2020, when we realized we were in, in terrible trouble, um, people started buying guns. And or he's he's originally a Canadian. He's a Canadian. And why would people do that? Because that just seems so foreign to him. And he realized it's because our media keeps telling us that when we get into a crisis, it's going to be, you know, Thunderdome and we're all going to have to protect, you know, and, and shoot each other and, and do all that sort of thing to survive. The problem with that story is that it is false. Um, and he realized he'd been telling that story and he had been doing, by doing that, he had been teaching people that when we get into a serious trouble, we're all going to turn on each other. When in reality, when we get into serious trouble, we help each other. Even neighbors who hate each other after there's a tornado, they're helping each other pick stuff up. Um, and so he's not going to write a story anymore that doesn't reflect the reality of how people actually behave in a stressful situation. And that is that they are good to each other, that they try to keep things going. And I agree with him and I don't want to write stories. Uh, I don't think I have, if I did, I'm sorry about that, but where people just turn on each other and it's a disaster uh, that just gets compounded by human misery. Um, I want to write something else. So Lord of the Flies is, is a, a, a classic book. I had to read that in school and did some kids on an island and eventually they all turn on each other and, and um, it becomes savagery. But that's not true. The real truth of what people would be like if they were stranded on a desert island, and we know because this happens, is it's going to be more like Gilligan's Island which is a story with a whole lot of problems, except for the way people relate to each other, which is they all try to get along and solve the problems of survival together, um, more or less intelligently. Um, and that would be more reflective of what reality is, is we're living on Gilligan's Island and not Lord of the Flies. Kind of what I'm hearing is that you want your fiction both to be reflecting reality and human nature in an accurate way and in a useful way where it's actually like conducive to people acting ethically. Uh, am I hearing that correctly? Um, yeah. And, and here's another, there is a whole, we joke that my fiction has a high body count. I kill a lot of people. There's a lot of violence. And I thought about that once. And it's because my whole life has just been surrounded by violence, not particularly personally. But I mean, there's at least four genocides going on at this very minute. Um, so that, yeah, I live in, 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 in a violent world. But in my book, Violence Has Consequences, I remember I was watching, it was a Star Trek movie and there was this horrible crash and a spaceship came and like wiped out parts of, of San Francisco and crashing into buildings. And I'm going, wait a minute, there are people in those buildings. What's happening with them? What is happening with all this destruction? And the movie did not deal with that, but I'm like, there's a whole moral story, a whole moral consequence, whole individuals here, um, it was just a massive disaster that you just sort of hand waved. It's not important. The important part is what's happening over here. And I think that might be a good story to tell is, is okay, so you're just going about your life and the superheroes are having a battle and like they destroy your house. Yeah. They destroy your job. They destroy half your city. That's I think that's a story that needs to be told. That's something that that we've been ignoring in in not all the time. There's a whole lot more that's written than, than you see in in movies. But yeah, what happens to you know just some schlub who's go who and then you know Godzilla goes by and then you're homeless. Hmm. 
wanted to ask, I remember in one of your interviews, you talked about how sometimes it can be hard to write and something that you'll do as a trick is to like tell yourself you can eat a cookie after you write a chapter or something like that. And I was curious when you are sitting down to write, like what is your subjective experience of what's difficult about writing such that you motivate yourself in that way? What's that like for you when you sit down to write and it's challenging? Um, it's work. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's work and we are all lazy. I am very lazy and I would rather do anything else than work. Mm. Um, and so it's a matter of making myself actually do my job. And sometimes it's bribery. Um, uh, sometimes it's, you know, just try to be the boss and say, you know, you got a deadline, you got to deal with this. Um, and sometimes it's, I can do two work avoidance things and then I have to actually do my job. But yeah, it's, it's work. But once I start, that's the thing. I know once I start, I'll be doing it. And I've got to go to the bathroom and say, no, just one more sentence, I'll cross my legs. And um, so once I start, it's good. But it's the starting that's the hard part for me. Hmm. Are there specific fears that come up or like challenges or um, things that make that difficult or aversive for you? Oh, my God. Let me count the ways. I mean, I have a book. Oh, yeah. um, it's in, on on my shelf. Uh, it's called The Writer's Book of Doubt. Um, and it's a very, very excellent book. And it's it's about imposter syndrome and this and that and jitters and, you know, and and why can't I write a story as good as Ted Chiang? Mm. And um, all sorts of stuff. And it's a very, very excellent work, book. I recommend it. I can't read it because... It's like a hypochondriac reading a doctor's manual of lists of symptoms. And, you know, am I sure that I don't have elbow cancer? Um, so I, um, yeah, there's every sort of, I'm a little bit of an anxious person mm. and I'm okay with that. But that also means I need to work around that sometimes. Mm. So I've got a book I won't read that I recommend to everyone else. Mm. It's all, all of the problem. And, and there's good advice in there, too. Um, there's one chapter I can read um, hmm. by Cameron Hurley, and it's how, she, how, how to learn to do something by failing at it utterly. Because hmm. I did on my, one of my novels is I just, it was so bad. I had so many problems. But I learned so much by forcing myself to finish the novel, which I had to do because there was a contract. There was like a boss breathing, breathing down my neck. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, we, yeah, I'm just a whole bowl of all sorts of problems. Mm. Well, but, uh, yeah. but I know I have them and I know it's normal. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I'm old. I have arthritis. Everyone gets that. You're not being particular. This is just normal life. Uh, which ones tend to come up for you, though? Like, what, what's that like for you subjectively? Well, it's varied over time. Mm -hmm. um, our, well, for example, right now, I, I don't I'm not reading my reviews. Or if there is a review, I make my husband read it first, and he can tell me if I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and the the I read the good ones because that tells me what I should continue to do. And sometimes the very very bad ones, um, just because they're funny, um, is I don't like this book because the cover is the wrong color. I mean what's worst about them is I don't like this book because you missed this part and they're right. Yeah, I missed that part. Um, but um, yeah, I don't read my regularly read my reviews. I don't read all of my reviews. I know people who do that and I advise against that because some of the reviews are just bad reviews in the sense that it's not that, that they don't like your work. 
but that they have done a very bad job of reviewing. Um, a review ideally is a creative response to a creative work, and some of them are just, they're something else. Hmm. They could be vicious, they could be stupid, they could be reacting. It, you know, I wanted a book that had apples and ears had oranges. Hmm. You often imagine, like if you're sitting down to write, would, might you imagine like a bad review coming up and like hearing what someone would say or something like that? Oh, I try not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. In, in some sense, when you're a journalist, you're in the firing line all the time. So you learn to take the criticism. As long as the criticism is not true, it's okay. <laughs> when they point out you did something wrong, well, then there's a problem. <laughs> but no, mostly I try to write for my ideal reader. My ideal reader is someone who is smarter than I am. And the way that I do that is through successive edits. Um, I try to put in a little bit more intelligence at every every time through. So eventually I sort of build up to something that's smarter than I did the first time at least. Um, so my ideal reader is, is, um, is smarter than I am, uh, will understand what I'm doing um, will pick up on on um, the clever things that I hope I'm doing um, and is also interested in in what I'm trying to write and what the topic is um, so that you know with semiosis is really all about plants. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like plants, you're not going to like that book. What do you do tactically when you're editing to sort of add a layer of intelligence every time? What is that actually like for you? Um, when I re-edit where I see where someone could have made, for example, a smarter choice, even though that will have consequences later, but let that person do the more intelligent thing. Um, adding complications, also choosing characters who are complex. One of the novels I might write now, I have some submitted some to see if a publisher wants to buy any of them, is you know, there's a, a factory owner and the factory has a terrible problem. And the stereotypical thing is that the factory owner doesn't care the fact about the fact that he's harming his everyone around the factory. But what if this guy really cares? What if he really wants to solve this problem? What's going to stop him? I don't know that yet. But you know, he's responding as intelligently as he can. And what are the, the most difficult problems that he's going to face that he may or may not be over, able to overcome? So it's, you know, what would be the most difficult thing for someone to have to do. I love that. I love that. Sort of at the opposite end of writing, like how do you do research or preparation for starting a new novel? Um, pretty extensively. Um, I know people who pants things and, and I recommend against that, not because it doesn't work, but because it's a really, really hard way to work. The more you know about something, the more, the easier the writing gets because you can make mistakes, but they're in the pre-writing stages. Um, a book I want to write, I actually got the idea, I think in, in 2022, 2021, no, 2022. Um, and still working on, so if this happened on this planet, what would be the consequences? And starting to think through them, doing some research. Um, if there's going to be a first contact, there's actually ethics for first contact. What would those ethics be if you applied them? What happens when you break them? Um, so just doing a whole bunch of, uh, asking all of the questions that I can um, to try to work out 
a structure for a novel. What is the most, the story that I want to tell in this case, can we do justice in a difficult situation? Well, what is justice? Oh, that's a good thing to interview. I would take me my whole life, but I'm, so I'm not gonna do the whole thing. But what can I learn about justice that would affect this book? I have a whole book about justice that basically says it always ends tragically. You can never do justice. Hmm. What did the oh, research yeah. for the semiosis series look like? Um, dig and sprawl. Well, I'm still doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, because I'm now on the third book, but no. Um, it was like, what can I learn about plants? What can I learn about um, agriculture? What can I learn about how group dynamics would work? Um, I had a whole book on um, how can you imagine a, if you're going to invent a planet, what can happen there? And that's actually where I got, I realized I had a story <clears throat> because I knew from my re previous research that that plants need iron. Iron is very important to plants, um, but we live on an iron-rich planet, so it's usually not hard for them to get. But you can't. If a, certain things happen on a planet, there's not much surface iron at all. So if plants need iron, and they're on a planet where they can't get iron, it's like plants here who need nitrogen. And if you're in a, a nitrogen-poor environment, what do they do? Well, they get here they eat animals because animals have lots of nitrogen. I also have lots of iron. My blood, blood is red from iron. So I have a whole planet where animals are necessary to the survival of these plants. And then there's a natural conflict. So if you have a plant that wants to protect humans, but also really needs their iron, then how does that work out? And what kinds of problems will come from that? What's the most enjoyable part of the research and preparation process for you? Hmm. Well, when I research, I look for problems because you know, I can't research forever. I do have to write a book. So I'm just looking for trouble. And when I find trouble, um, that to me is exciting. But what do I mean by trouble? Well, in this case, how do plants get the nutrients that they need and how do they respond when they're in a nutri nutri uh, nutrient poor environment and can I create that? Um, uh, one of the um, novels that I might write um, what happens to a family if they're in a very stressful situation, but they're still a loving family and they're trying to help each other and they run into all sorts of obstacles. So you know, what are family dynamics like? Um, in getting a chance to look at that, um, when uh, the, the usurpation book that is coming out, um, how do whole ecologies work? Um, and how many pieces can you pull out of an ecology or put into an ecology and how will that affect other things? Um, I don't know if that's a good answer, but yeah, looking for trouble. One of uh, a story I'm working on right now is that there's a singer who accomplishes great things well, we have Taylor Swift right now, who actually is is doing very good things. She's quite accomplished. Well, how, what does she do? How does she do that? What are some of the problems she has? How does she overcome them? Um, she treats her fans very, very well. What are the consequences of that? And, then, and these are good consequences, obviously. Um, and what, would that be a way to overcome a problem is that you had someone who's just very, very good. How would you say that you've grown as a novelist over 
the different books that you've written? Um, I hope I keep getting more bold ideas, more original ideas. Um, other people will tell, say if I succeeded, but that's what I tried to do. Um, and also exploring emotion, character emotions in, in a more honest and deep way. Which, again, you know, I look at what other writers do and how they do it. Um, you can get books about writing about character emotions and using that. Um, uh, I have a book written by counselors about emotional wounds and what does that do to people? Is there anything that you saw yourself like develop skills in over the different novels that you've written where you're like, oh yeah, I got a lot better at that or this the, earlier, I wasn't thinking about this, but now I'm thinking about this or something like that. It, it's just the pre-planning. Um, how how much can I know before I start, which just makes the writing easier. And also when you are writing and you don't have to worry about what, what happens next, you can concentrate on making the, the writing actually with the sentences actually the best that they can be. So it's that. So um, uh, can I use three by five cards? Is there software I could, can use um, any other tools that I can sometimes I I use just for a part of a novel um, or a part of a story. There was one where I needed to get the 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 dialogue exactly correct, and I was having trouble with that. And it was kind of good, so I literally printed it out, chopped it up, everybody talking in their sentences, and then rearranged them all, and then I had it. So it was you know scissors, scotch tape, and paper. Um, were the tools that I used for that. Um, I don't, I can't say I don't use, I use AI all the time. Everyone does. All of the writing things that you do in, if you have a good writing program and it checks your spelling and it points out mistakes and that, and um, MS Word actually gets kind of annoying, but that is an AI thing. We think of AI as like chatbot but it's in all sorts of other things. So you can use mechanized systems. Um, when I do my final proofread, um, Microsoft Word will read it aloud to you and there's lots of other programs that will do that as well. And if you listen to your story, when you think you're done, you'll find out you're not. Mm -hmm. um, that there's also, it discovers all sorts of things that you thought were good because when you read, you automatically correct errors. Um, but when someone reads it to you, when a machine reads it to you, it's going to find them all um, because it has no emotional investment in your story whatsoever. Hmm. Yeah, there Are there specific skills that you'd like to see yourself develop further in the future with future writing projects? I want to write bigger, richer stories. Mm -hmm. I want to be more bold. I want them to be more satisfying for the reader. Um, and some of the writing is a is 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 a practice discipline, um, and that was something I learned early on, and and really helped me out is to understand that writing is like playing music. The more music you play, the better you get at it. Um, so the more writing you do, the better you get at it. And so it's incrementally learning little things that, that you can do better. So I want to write virtuoso stories and in all of the different ways that a story can be good mm. and do it all at once and this week. Um, so it's just a big job. But that's one of the reasons why I love writing is that there's just no end to the creative challenge. Hmm. Do you have any advice that you would give other authors or that you find yourself giving frequently? Um, the best advice, and this is almost pretty much famous, it came from a, a writer named Robert Silverberg, and it is uh, 
read a lot, write a lot, read a lot more, and write a lot more. Again, it's a practice discipline. Um, you can learn a lot by reading when you see what other people did. I would add to that, if you can get a good critique group, and getting a good critique group is not always easy, but looking at what other people have done and seeing what they can do to make better or at least mistakes that they made that they need to figure out, um, that's going to teach you a lot very, very fast. The same way that teaching English taught me a whole lot about English. So if I'm looking at someone else's writing and evaluating it carefully, I can see what they did and hopefully not make those mistakes myself again. Because if I see them, it's because I probably did them at some point. Hmm. There's no mistake that you can make that I haven't probably made already. Or if not, maybe I should make them. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned in one of your interviews that um, you have found it really useful as a translator to study English, and I wondered how you've done that, what, what studying English has looked like for you. Well, I still study every day. I get a word of the day. Um, I subscribe to the um, Chicago Manual of Style, has a, a question and answer in a blog, and I follow that. So I'm still studying and I have whole books on how to write a beautiful sentence. Um, it's the mechanics of it. Um, the same way that is if I were a basketball player, I would do everything I could to perfect everything I can do with that basketball. Um, how do I throw? How do I dribble? Um, so I, I would be an expert at everything you can do with a basketball. So everything I can do with the English language. So if you do a sentence, where you put the words in the sentence, show the reader what's important. Readers see this. They don't always understand it. They don't always real, realize it, but it works. So where do I put the words in the sentence that will mean, show the reader what's really important? Um, for example, the very last word in a sentence is the strongest place. The last sentence in a paragraph is the strongest sentence. The strong. Um, so how do I arrange the ideas? Um, some of it's mechanical. I don't want my reader to wonder who's talking at some point. And this is a real problem when you're writing, is to make sure that they know who's talking, but not in a way that interferes with the, their pleasure of reading, because it should be a joy for them to read too. So mechanical ways to do that, um, and can I perfect that? And as I'm writing, is this the very best way to handle this particular problem um, in this paragraph? What's a good description? Um, different kinds of stories require different kinds of, of description, and to be aware that if I'm writing a romance, romances tend to like really lush prose, and sometimes I am writing a love story. So how can I do that? Um, other kinds of stories want different kinds of things. So it's to take enough of a step back that I can see the art that I am doing. Um, and, and it can take practice too. I mean, many artists make studies and sketches and practices before they they do the whole work and it's the same um if i have a character maybe pretend i'm sitting down talking to this character and interviewing them so i can get a better idea of when i finally get to the story what is that person like if i've done it really well they'll start telling me what they want to say at that particular point um, because I know them well enough that I can just hear them talk the way that if you think about a friend, you know, well, what would Ginny say about that? Well, you know, because you know Ginny. I'm remembering that uh, there was a chapter in, I forget which of the two of the semiosis novels that are out where I was, this was one of my favorite chapters was the, uh, there's like a mystery and there's a character that's sort of like playing a detective role. And 
um, I wonder how you thought about that chapter and um, like how to structure it. And, you know, cause it was, it was sort of one of the, it was so charming. Cause it's like, I mean, I love mysteries. And then also it was like, sort of, um, it was sort of a self-contained story and like it's sort of a departure from the larger uh, arc of the story where it's like, oh, there's going to be a mystery now and we're going to figure out who who done it and that sort of thing. And I wonder how you thought about structuring that chapter. Um, well, I entered it knowing a number of things. Well, I the first point of my chapter is this is going to be where they discover the glassmakers. So we had to do that. Um, that they exist. Um, the following chapter, we're going to meet the glassmakers. Um, and it's going to go very badly. Um, but they're going to discover that they exist. So I had to put that in there. Well, how do I get there? Um, and experimenting with ideas. Um, and then well, what if I make it a murder mystery? Well, there's whole things about murder mysteries. Um, there's a great many ways that you can do them. Well, what are some of the ways? How can you do some of the investigation? Um, I also wanted to show how Steven was working within human society um, and do that at once. And art. I like art. I can throw an art in there, but what would that mean to the story then? If you had an artist who sadly I killed, but I really feel bad about all the people that I kill. I'm, I guess I joke about that as self-defense, but I really feel bad. I mean, there's one of the chapters there I cry every time because I was just so mean to that character. Mm. Um, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, so... Bearing all that in mind, I started to work it out. Um, and there's some false starts. There's some experimenting. At some point, um, it was really key, key what was going to happen. One of the things was I wanted the, well, all my characters to have a, a good ethical backbone. And this character did. And how would that affect what she's going to do? Um, when she discovers some uncomfortable things and how will she respond? What would be the ethical thing for her to do? And she does that. Um, but that has consequences too. So it was a matter of putting all sorts of things together and sh shifting them until they fit. It took a few tries took a whole lot of, of of work and investigation but it's fun work so i i'm not complaining mm -hmm. and i was very satisfied with the way her character turned out in the end when i read a mystery or watch a movie that's a mystery or like sometimes they're like crime stories or something um especially as I've started writing fiction, I'm often left with the sensation of like, how did they do that? How did they pull that off? Like all these different pieces fit together so well. And, you know, ob obviously, as you're just saying, it took a few tries and trying different things. And um, um, mm, I mean, it's like any time that you see someone that's really good at something, you're like, they make something really hard, look easy and smooth and not that difficult. It's like, whoa, that's incredible. And um, um I, what's the question? It's like, you mentioned really? that, yeah, you mentioned that, um, like, there's different ways that mysteries work. And I wonder how you think about that and how you would explain how mysteries work and uh, how you're thinking about that with that chapter. Um, the truth is, I wrote that so long ago, I kind of have forgotten. But mm. I can tell you the book that I, I just wrote, the third book in the, the trilogy. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think this is a is a spoiler, is that the rainbow bamboo has to take over the earth. Mm. Um, that's the job that they're given. They're going to do that. Um, and how do they do that? And there are six chapters in there. And I was literally writing the sixth chapter, and I don't know how to solve this problem that I've set up. 
I don't know how they're going to take over the earth. And, but in a nice way. Um, and all of a sudden I realized that I'd set up this and that and the next thing, um, the plot got pretty complicated. And there was one thing, oh yeah, they're already doing it. You just, I just didn't notice that, that they were. And then I could write that in. It took a few tries and to fit more more things in but in this case it was i had a lot of things and then the pieces finally fell together for me it would have been so much nicer if i had known that in the first place because i was really you know I'm, I'm this is the i'm finishing it and i don't know how um but i did and i think it worked out nicely um but there's a lot of experimentation. I like to think that there's plotters and pantsers, and I'm a plotter. But you, um, Napoleon said that there's no battle plan that survives contact with the enemy. So you can plan things out, and then you get there, and you realize, no, nope, I did not expect that. Mm. But it did. Um, in this case, it was just realizing what what I had on hand and how I could use those things. Um, and if you talk to, to, I know someone who writes mysteries and she just says, it's really hard and you have to go back and forth till you figure things out. Um, also do some, was it Lori Day? And she wrote a book um, about a murder mystery that takes place. There's called the Dark Sky, Dark Sky um, uh um, areas where there's no light and you can actually see the, all the stars. And so what if there was a murder mystery that, that took place there? So she went there. She spent a weekend at one or and to understand how the, that would work. Um, so with some of the things that she learned doing that. But if you're having problems, everyone has that problem. Read that book. Write his book of doubt. It's There's everything... If you're having problems, it's just because everyone does. Everyone has the same problems. Not always in the same book, but I invite invent new problems with every book because there's something new to learn. It makes me curious. I'm, you know, it occurs to me that you know, we're having this conversation at a specific moment in time where I've read two books in a series that I like, and the third one's not out yet. And, uh, you know, you've written other novels since then. And that's, I imagine that's, you know, got to be pretty different as a writer than it would have been, you know, 100 years ago, certainly, but also even 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And um, I'm curious what your experience is like writing in an age where you can communicate with your readers or, you know, you, you talked earlier about reading reviews and how you try to avoid the bad reviews and have your husband read things, but like, what's that like for you as an author where um, you can really communicate with your readers and interact with them? Oh, it's great. Good fun. Hmm. Um, I was challenged by one of my readers. If I could put him into his, the book and his only requirement was that he die heroically. <laughs> <laughs> well um so but i kill a lot of people i can kill you too brian um so um but no it's good fun and and we exchange things and um it becomes sort of a friendship um and so yeah, it's it's a lot more fun you did than it used to be. Um because I started writing on a manual typewriter. Um and I I'm 68, I remember pre-internet times, and it was pretty lonely. Um we got around that in various different ways, but in the end, um you never got much feedback on what you did. In some ways that's good because you get there's a lot of 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 deliberately negative feedback. Um, there are no, there's not a greater number of jerks, to use a nice word, than there were in the past. Um, 
but there used to it used to be hard for them to do anything and now because there's so few barriers it it's easier for them to be bigger jerks than ever um there's not more but there's no fewer number of good people too out there and supportive people and people just want to have fun and um or so they're there too and you can can find those people a whole lot more easy easily Has talking to your readers influenced the way you write at all? Um, some, yeah. I mean, say, can if you, you know, I hear you're writing the third book in this trilogy, can you make sure that there's a whole lot of wor world building because I really love the world building? Hmm. Yeah, I can do that. Um, um, so. Yeah, sometimes they say things, or I really, in, or if they liked something, or this was funny. Yeah. Um, if they enjoyed it, I can do that. I mean, and I don't want one of the great things about science fiction, fantasy, horror, that whole genre, as George R. R. Martin said, we're all fans. We all like each other. We're we're all in this because we have fun. Um. But when authors talk to each other, and we're all fans, um, but we give each other hints, you know, and I read your book, and I really like this thing, and and I have this problem, well, here's a way you might be able to solve it. Um, so there's a whole community out there, and, and the internet made it a little easier, um, and particularly in the genre that I'm in. Fans were already integrated in the first place. There's science fiction conventions so that you can always talk to people who want to be readers. Um, but now it's easier than ever to do that. So the community has gotten bigger and more lively. And I think that that's just helped everyone. Um, and as I say, there's some jerks. Probably a lot of people who want to help you. If I'm not mistaken, I think you alluded to uh, working on learning a third language. Is that right? I'm studying Latin right now. Hmm. I speak Spanish, but my translation specialty, not a lot of calls for this, but medieval and Renaissance Spanish. And at some point that sort of slides into Latin, so it helps. Also, I'm writing a book uh, it's a historical novel uh, about a Spanish queen, but at that point, they were still speaking Latin in Spain um, as the official language. And some of the best resources available are actually in Latin. Um, so I can read her actual words, but I have to learn another language to do that. What... Um... You know, you've written a lot of science fiction novels. What made you want to write a historical fiction novel? Well, I was living in Spain mm -hmm. and learned about uh, a queen. She lived around 1100, and she just led an amazing life. Um, her second marriage ended in a civil war. Um, at one point, she was being stoned to death by an angry mob, and she talked her way out of it. Wow. Well, um, a whole bunch of more other things happened to her. So she just has a great story, and um, I think I can tell it. Are there any other genres you could see yourself exploring? If I had time? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I've written some some mainstream literary fiction, and that's always very satisfying. Um and in the structure, of, I write, write a little bitty mini mis mystery, um, uh, different things. I keep threatening to write a romance. I don't think I have yet, but I'll keep trying. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, and the, the barriers between genres are pretty permeable. Um, so, yeah.
Mm. I like all sorts of things. Mm. I can't see writing YA just because I, I would have to learn way too much. Um, I know why people who write that. And it's a, truly an honor to have young readers. But that's not something that I aspire to only because there's my life is I'm not going to live that long. Mm. I don't have time to learn that that much new. But I read yeah. YA literature. It's some great stuff. You mentioned this uh, advice to read a lot and write a lot. And I'm curious about what are your habits as a reader and what is your reading life like? Um, I never quite read enough. Um, but um, I try to keep up with what's being published in the genre um, because you can see what other people are doing. In some ways, it's a conversation. So if some people are writing a novel, um, I don't know, set in a slightly different universe, how are they handling that? And what kinds of stories do they have to tell? And um, also just to enjoy a good story. Um, Right now, I'm. It's life beyond us, and it's a a, a book. Uh, Susan Susan Forrest is one of the editors. You can find it, um, and it's short stories about alien life forms. And then there's an essay by a scientist saying, "Well, what would what, what's the actual thing? How accurate is the story, and um, what do we actually know?" Um, so it's a series of that. So it's the fun of, of some, there's some really good writers in there and some really fine stories. And then comparing that to reality and, and what did the story illustrate about what it would be really like to meet that kind of alien? Uh, what, what would, so that's one that I'm reading. Uh, of course, I just read Murderbot, but that was just for fun. Um, and beyond that, I don't, I mean, if my Kindle was like real books, I could not pick that thing up. So um, we estimated once, we think we have a thousand actual physical books in this, in our apartment, my husband and I. So I, my reading is somewhat, somewhat eclectic. I try to be systematic and fail out of it. What does your husband like to read? He likes to read a lot of history, also science fiction. We had when the Murderbot novel finally arrived from the bookstore at the bookstore, we had this little fight over who's going to read it first. Um, um, science fiction particularly likes to read kind of history um, and other sorts of nonfiction. He read all of Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. And if you know that book, that's just a feat in itself. That's funny because I went to uh, St. John's College and that was the only book on the program at St. John's that I didn't finish reading for class. I just I just gave up on it. So this is too boring for me. So that's amazing. Well, what was funny is we bought it. It's a series of volumes and we bought it at a secondhand bookstore. And the final volume um when they make books, they, they print sheets and then they fold them all up and then they cut them. And that's how you get the book. And some of the novel, the pages had managed not to get cut. You see that sometimes happened. Um, so they had not been cut. No one had read this book. It was from 1880. Um, people just owned it. So no one had finished that book either. Wow. You're not the first. Mm -hmm. Do you two talk about what you're reading? Oh, yeah. What's that like for you to talk about what you're reading with your husband or hear about what he's reading? Um, It's fun. When I was reading Murderbot and all of a sudden I would start to giggle and he, you don't tell me. <laughs> uh, but um, and we share um, ideas, what we like, what we didn't like. Um, um He's reading his. He reads history books and episodes in his history. The last one he read was about the the um, 
the Portuguese Empire, which just is like, I can't, it's just this horrible, horrible litany of errors. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me about some of the things that were really stupid that, that the Portuguese did in one way or another, or vicious or failures. Um, so it doesn't matter that. Um, occasionally we watch a movie or TV together and, and we like heckle the movie. Um, so it's fun. It's a, we, it's a good way to exchange ideas. Also, he, I keep telling him he should be a writer because he's really good at, at, he understands these things. Um, and he even took a class. Um, but he says he sees how hard I work and he doesn't want to work that hard. Do you uh, let him read your novels? Oh, yeah. And in fact, in the one that, that's coming out, um, I thank him in, in the acknowledgement as the chief technobabble consultant. Because <laughs> it's about, there's some computers in there. And um, I he told me that, you know, what the computers would be doing at this time, you should use these words. And and this is a Bayesian process. Use the word Bayesian. Mm. Um, and so he helped me that way. Mm. Is there any specific kind of support that you ask for him, him for besides that specific example? Sometimes leave me alone. Don't uh -huh. play and I'm working. Do uh -huh. not disturb. Because he yeah. works out of his, out of, well, since COVID now, he's working out of his home too. Mm. And they've never called people back in his office. And so we we're in different rooms, but mm. so sometimes it's just the space to work, but sometimes it's bouncing ideas off of him. Um, he's read my proposals for my next novel and had some suggestions. So has my critique group. You mentioned in one of your interviews that uh, there was a story that you were very excited to learn to read as a kid. Uh, I was, and but you didn't mention what that story was. Do you remember what it was? It wasn't the one about the apples. Hmm. Um, no, I'm not sure. Do um, which? Well, I was always reading. Mm -hmm. I mean, when it came time to study hall in the schools I was in, you could also go to the library. And I was always in the library. <laughs> um, I remember my junior high school, I read through their whole entire science fiction section one hour at a time. And it was a very good se selection looking back. The, the librarians did a good job of picking out good books. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk more about or, yeah? Mm. I don't think, probably not. Maybe just my interest in, in what other people are like and what other people are doing um, and just general curiosity. And that's another good advantage that I've always had in a writer, as being a writer, is you can be curious about anything and say, oh, well, it's just for work. You don't have to justify the fact that suddenly you want to know everything that there is to know about an Arwell tusk. Hmm. Because it's it's going to be in the novel. Sure, yeah. Um, so that, um, and to get to know other people, um, it's one of the reasons I don't really meditate is, and it's a good thing, but I would rather be around other people, learn more about other people, um, enjoy their company than be alone because I have to be alone for my work all the time. And I do have my imaginary friends to play with, and that's always a good thing, but I'm very interested in the world around me and worlds that could exist and the whole universe out there, and these planets we haven't found yet. How about yourself? What would you like to know? So what are you writing? You say you're working on novels. 
What kind of novels? Hmm. Uh, the one I'm writing right now is sort of part romance, part mystery, and it's uh, what to say about it. It's called It Wasn't. I have a draft of it, and I'm sort of working on revising it now, and it's pretty short. Um, with, I wrote a novella last year as well, and that one was, I don't know, 40 pages or something, and that's about the same length that this one is. I think it's a little bit longer, but um, yeah, they ha haven't been able to write anything very long yet. Um, yeah, I suppose it's fair to say that it's based on my hometown and like an alternate version of my hometown and also an alternate version of my life. Uh, the main character is sort of based on me, but imagining a really different version of my own life. And um, yeah, the the name of the town, I, I like wrote it with my own name and certain characters and references to my town and then changed everything with find and replace. And so it's set in West Chesterton now, which is not a real town, and uh, isn't the town that I grew up in. But um, yeah, it's that's sort of the setting and rough themes and that sort of thing. It sounds like it could be very satisfying and also a lot of fun to write. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun writing it. Um, I feel like the first with the first novella I wrote, uh, I had a lot of like inner critic type stuff coming up. And this time I feel like that hasn't happened so much. And I've sort of hit my stride for how to write different scenes and sort of made this little ritual for how I've been writing the scenes where I pick which one I want to write. And then I read a few pages of a novel that I'm inspired by or want to emulate. And then I sort of imagine how the scene goes down and I put some music on this music plays a big part in this novel. And every chapter has like a track that's associated with it. And, uh, it's sort of like songs that would have been playing at that time and, um, or that the characters might've liked or something like that. And, yeah, and then I write it sort of stream of consciousness while I'm listening to this music and have sort of imagined what happens. And yeah, I found when I write things that are not fiction, I almost am never staring at a blank page because I've written notes about what I want to write. And usually I've written like tweets or something about it or various notes to myself and or correspondence. I'll draw on like correspondences that I've had. And I think I had that problem at first with fiction of like staring at the blank page and like, what do I actually say now and since i've put work to imagine the scene ahead of time then that makes it a lot easier to write it when i get to that point it's, it sounds like like good techniques for for doing this sort of thing what was mm -hmm. it like to revisit your hometown hmm in fiction or in literal in the fiction um hmm it's sort of nice, I think, um, healing in a way. Like, I, on the one hand, I was really lucky and grew up in a pretty privileged town and, you know, I had everything I needed and all of that. And then on the other hand, there were sort of social dynamics that I never really liked or uh, that never made me feel at home. And um, I can sort of allude to different things that I didn't like about the town and uh, write about them. And, um, uh, uh, I think just sort of validate my own experience of like, yeah, it was like that because there wasn't, there weren't other people or the town itself wouldn't criticize itself in a certain way. And I can be like, yeah, that, that kind of didn't work. And that was a problem in school or something like that and see things from a new perspective. And um, I have, I just wrote a scene recently at the end of the novel where they, this is not a spoiler, but the, the main character, um, like walks out of the classroom and it's just like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I never had the courage to do that sort of thing in high school. And uh, it was sort of empowering to imagine, you know, this character who's be based on an alternate version of myself, like doing that and be like, I, I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, I think I have that kind of courage as an adult and it's sort of healing to like imagine myself with that courage as a teenager and just be like, yeah, this is, this is dumb. I'm not putting up with this. And, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been he healing and validating to ha write something that's sort of set in my hometown. 
Mm. Yeah, that's the fun of writing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's I'm been glad nice you're to doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun for me and uh, it's been nice to talk with you about fiction because it's something that I'm interested in learning about and I really like your story so I'm grateful that you've uh, humored my questions at such length. Well, I'm I hope it was helpful. Mm, definitely and was. And anyone out there if you're trying to write, I wish you nothing but the best. <laughs> it's just a great thing to do. Even just a little bit well, thanks so much, Sue. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you.